or under the Linden Street, was to be extended and the road was to be widened to 200 feet. It would be renamed the East-West Axis, and crossing it would be an even bigger one, the North-South Axis. The North-South Axis was inspired by the famous Parisian boulevard, the Champs-Élysées. Only Germania Street would be 70 feet wider at a total width of 400 feet. The 400-foot-tall triumphal arch would sit at its head. This north-south axis was meant to be the official parade route of Germania, and the tunnels Dietmar and I were exploring below allowed it to stay traffic-free. Dwarfed by the oversized administration buildings of the Reich, jubilant masses would have been ushered along this route, leading to the Volkshall, or People's Hall. Its precise location at the end of the parade route would have actually required diverting the River Spree. The Volkshalle was designed to be 950 feet high and was to be topped with the largest dome in the world. That's six times larger than its inspiration, the Pantheon in Rome. 150 to 180,000 people could have fit inside. Made entirely of granite, the Great Hall would have been the focal point of Germania and would have weighed in at over 550 tons. But the Great Hall was never built. In fact, modern engineers say the body heat of 170,000 people in the dome-shaped building would have caused so much precipitation, rain would actually fall from the ceiling. The north-south access or parade route was never completed either, and neither was Hitler's triumphal arch. Speer estimated he could transform the entire face of Berlin by 1950. Planning began in 1935, but by 1941, Berlin was a full-blown battlefield and his attention was turned to building bunkers. The tunnels beneath the park are one of the few things left of Hitler's ill-fated dream world. Today, over 50 feet separated them with the city Hitler planned up above, but the soil alone puts forth over 6,000 pounds per square foot of pressure. Could these tunnels possibly hold the weight of Germania? Even Speer wasn't sure. He knew Hitler's grand plans would test the bounds of engineering. So architect Speer came up with his own test. He built the GBK, or load-bearing building, on a site with similar soil conditions as the proposed arch. He then poured 12,650 tons of concrete to create a structure that mimicked the ground pressure of one of the two footings of the arch. The ground pressure of the GBK equaled 1.2 meganewtons per square meter, or over 10 tons per square foot. If the ground sank more than two and a half inches, Berlin soil would not support the arch and most of Germania's immense buildings. It sank seven inches in three years, proving many of Hitler's buildings would have been impossible to build. But Hitler didn't accept the results. Speer was still looking into ways to fortify Germania's soil when bombs began to fall in Berlin in the summer of 1940. Should the world still care about this place? I think this is necessary to save this because it's one of the last traces of this Germania planning. And if you fill this or you damage this, uh, you have nothing uh, realistic you can remember this uh, crazy planning of Hitler, you know. If you ne not can remember to your history, the danger is really high that you can repeat this. To never forget. Yes. Up next, nothing could take this building down. Eric, please come in. Hitler was a dedicated non-smoker and reportedly promised a gold watch to any of his close associates who quit. Berlin is often called the most rebuilt city in the world. After World War II, roughly 60% of its buildings were destroyed. Even today, old buildings are being torn down to make way for new ones. But there is one part of Berlin's past that still remains, its underworld. After seeing Hitler's and Speer's grand plans for Germania, it was obvious they'd never dream of building something just to have it buried beneath the ground. Ironically, today that's all that's left of their legacy. When war became imminent, Speer had no choice but to direct his attentions underground. His task? to make Berlin bomb-proof. It's estimated there are over a thousand bunkers buried beneath Berlin. Some were destroyed like the Fuhrer bunker. Others have been left abandoned like the one I'd seen at the traffic ministry. Some are hidden under homes or offices. 
And there's even one beneath this major metro stop. Dietmar, guten Tag. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I met up again with underground expert Dietmar Arnold in East Berlin's Alexanderplatz, or Alexander Place. He wasted no time showing me one of the Berlin Underworlds Association's greatest finds. Located just off the Alexanderplatz metro, commuters walk by this inconspicuous door each day. Dietmar has asked us to disguise its location so ordinary citizens don't attempt to explore this dangerous piece of Berlin's underworld on their own. We had just entered one of Berlin's largest underground civilian air raid shelters, and people waiting for the metro up above had no idea we were down here. You listen now, this, this is noise. So. This is a sound from the metro. Yeah, you can hear this now, right? You can hear the metro. During wartime, the rumbling above didn't mean the train had arrived at the station, but that hundreds of bombers had descended on the city. Two million tons of bombs and explosive devices were dropped on Berlin by the Allies during the war. That's nearly 800 tons a day by 1945. In the end, the estimated death toll from Allied bombings was anywhere from 600,000 to a million people. By 1945, there were only enough bunkers in Berlin for 10% of the population. But for those who made it into this government-built bunker, there are no confirmed records of any bomb-related deaths. That's partly because of Berlin's sandy soil. When a bomb fell, the soft soil would help to absorb the shock of the blast. The bunker below would sway like a ship, and the walls protecting the people would stay intact. So explain to me about the construction of this bunker. Yes, so we are here around 12, 30 meters under Alexander Place, and we have here three underground levels, but over we have a ceiling from three meters, steel concrete, the walls around two meters. This was one of the safety's bunker here around Alexander Place. Walls six feet thick, concrete ceilings 10 feet thick, and above that, 10 feet of sandy soil to absorb the shock of bombs. That's outrageous compared to normal building standards. In fact, the ceiling's live load, or the total amount of pressure the ceiling can handle, is 2,500 times the load of a normal building. Normal buildings today are constructed to withstand a live load of only 75 to 100 pounds per square foot. That means the ceiling of Alexander Platz can support more than 200,000 pounds, or nearly three 18-wheeler trucks per square foot. This protective bunker was built to hold 3,500 people, but during the worst bombing, 9,000 people were crammed down here. There was a lot of people in the entrances, but this was full. You know, and so they could not go in, and then they have five minutes to look for another place, you know. And uh, there were some situations, for example, when they opened the bunker after a bomb attack, 50 people's light in the entrance was dead because they could not go in. One thing you can't help but notice is that it's cold down here. When citizens, civilians, soldiers came down here, were they freezing during the winter? You need not a heating system because if are here 9,000 people inside that's warm up here so fast, you cannot believe this. It's like, say, if you go inside of a sauna. The average person has the body heat equivalent to that of a 100-watt light bulb. So if this is a 100-watt lamp, yes. and there's 9,000 of these in here, yes. suddenly it's a sauna. Yeah, it's like a heating system. Since they first gained access in the late 1990s, Dietmar and Berlin's Underworlds Association continue to explore Alexanderplatz, hoping to find more clues to unlock the secrets of Berlin's dark past. And on a visit last year, they found one. They were drilling a hole to measure the thickness of this wall. About four feet in, the drill popped out into a hollow space. They put a tiny camera through the hole and saw a large tunnel. And the tunnel go in this direction, and the tunnel go in this direction, and nobody know what's behind, really. So you're saying there's another bunker behind this one? It's possible. So it may be like a time capsule in there that's never been opened? Maybe. My next stop was a residential neighborhood in East Berlin. I met up with Dietmar's underworld partner, Sasha Kyle. Eric? Nice to see you again. 
Nice to see you too. Thank you for showing me around some more. Yes, welcome to the, welcome to the Fichtelstraße. We were in the neighborhood of Kreuzberg, which was almost completely destroyed during World War II. But one oddly shaped building remained from that time. The building was called the Gasometer and stood 69 feet high and 184 feet wide. It was originally built in 1846 as a substation of Kreuzberg gas. But the introduction of electric street lamps in the late 1800s made this substation obsolete. In 1940, the Germans converted it into a bunker, but this was no ordinary bunker. Few others before had perfected above the ground bunkers like the Nazis, but they had to, since they were running out of the time, money, and supplies needed to continue building underground. They started looking for existing buildings to fortify. The gasometer, or Fichte bunker, was an ideal candidate. Five stories were above the ground and one was below. But all six floors were fortified and incredibly safe. Let's go. This is the only remaining entrance to the bunker. Eric, please come in. Smell of the, it smells like motor yes. oil, like a garage, yes, like yes, a, yes. where you fix cars. It's from the diesel. I'm smelling diesel. Okay. The strong smell of diesel was coming from the basement, where Sasha tells me there's a diesel power generator left over from the 1940s. It's a generator large enough to power this fortified city that had a population of 6,500. I was barely inside, but I could tell this place was massive and disoriented. I couldn't tell if I was above ground or below. Once a cavernous hole for holding gas, the Nazis added six separate floors connected by five stairwells and three lifts. Each floor had 120 rooms. The entire bunker had 25 kitchens, a hospital on each floor, and even a prison on the bottom level. Truly a city of its own. So this is a row of toilets, and here you go. I'm uh, imagining they were in a, a better state 60 years ago. Besetzt? Yes. What, a bus is besetzt? It's locked. So Someone this is, is locked, inside. right? You can see that someone's inside. Hello. The war's over, you can come out now. The Fichte bunker even had its own post office, used to communicate with other bunker cities in Berlin. Reichspost. It's a post system in, in Germany. Telegraphs, telegrams, phone. Yes. This is where it would come in right here. Communication from bunker to bunker wasn't uncommon. These fortified cities made every attempt to maintain some semblance of order in spite of the chaos outside. It was an orientation system, like this. You see the chamber numbers? The yeah. fingers are... Sure, okay, so that's Raum, or room 172 to 138 are over there. This is room 198 to 231. This tells you where the, the hospital is back here. It's like a, a dormitory, it's just sort of a macabre dormitory. Fichte Bunker had many signs and orientation devices. Eingang is uh, entrance. Entrance. But an extremely confusing layout. Another inner ring of rooms right here, just like the outer ring. I mean, it's just a labyrinth, a circle of rooms that keep going around. Sasha told me it was done on purpose. Not to confuse people, but bombs. The safest place to be in the bunker was the center. Fichte Bunker was built with three circular rings, and inside each ring were rooms whose angled walls helped to provide protection from blasts. It's simple physics. By the time the energy of the blast gets to the center of the bunker, it has been lessened 30% by each 90 degree angle it hits. How did they change the interior of this building from a gas storage facility to a bunker with 1,200 rooms, with kitchens, with bathrooms? How did they do that? They filled in the concrete. It was not so uh, difficult because an existing wall of bricks was here and uh, metal rings in it. And so they only had to fill the room between. So this was already a somewhat fortified building because of its nature? Yes. How much more concrete did they add to the brick structure that was already here? About two meters. Six more feet of concrete was added to the already five feet of existing brick. That made the walls nearly 12 feet thick. On top of that, the walls of the 720 inner rooms were all made of reinforced concrete, the key ingredient to Nazi bunker building techniques. This bunker saved upwards of 30,000 people from Allied bomb attacks. After the war, it became a shelter for Germans who had lost their homes. Later, it was filled with enough food to feed the entire city for two full days during the East German blockades of the West. 
This looks like carrots. We had uh, 7,000 tons of food stored here in this building. Ah, salted carrots. Delicious when your city gets blockaded.